Hello and welcome to Time for Tea with me and I'm very pleased to welcome an industry friend of many years, Mr. Stan Moot, CTO of IABM. Well, great to chat with you today, Andy, and it's sort of funny how we've switched the tables. I interview you all the time. Yeah, I was going to say, this is this is kind of a revenge for all the many, many events that we've done together when you've asked me lots of questions and I thought... Let me ask Stan some questions about what's happening. Well, we need to say also, we are actually live, as you can see probably from behind, at NAB New York, and there's quite a buzz going on. There is really. I, I have to tell you, though, a lot, I've been talking to a lot of people about the show here, and what they've been telling me is it's a, a lot different crowd than last year. There's more new people here. Yeah, very exciting. And I can tell you the sun is shining as we record this in New York. Absolutely. It is sunny. I won't say it's warm, but it's sunny, a little windy, but you know, it is what it is. So. Yeah. Now, this morning, um, you hosted a, a session, a breakfast session in one of the theatres here, talking about trends and analysing trends of the, of the media industry at the moment. I was wondering if you can maybe just unpack a few of those headlines for us in terms of things that you see that are important, things that are increasing or diminishing in, in importance, and, 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 and really what, yeah, what you've been learning about the industry in, in recent times. Well, one of the interesting <coughs> trends that I did show is a growth in hardware sales. And in talking to people after the event, they go, wow, that's cool. Now, of course, why is hardware going up? We're looking at, you know, people doing more things on-prem and hybrid. And that is a really switch of the industry because the industry was suddenly saying, hardware's dead, you know, nothing's happening. The other push, which you know, and I'll let you chat about this as well, let's not call it cloud anymore. What do we call it? Cloud services, most important on yeah. that. Um, <coughs> We, we clearly, though, one of the, the stats that did come out was very clear about living room TV viewing in the U.S. Yeah, tell us about that, because I was intrigued. I was really surprised when I looked at the stat, too. When we looked at the July stat, YouTube was the number one living room TV. <laughs> you know, obviously, in August, it moved over to NBC because of the Olympics. Absolutely. That makes sense. But doesn't that surprise you? It, it did surprise me. I was blown away by that. Yeah, that just shows what a shift has happened. Right. And I think one of the other shifts we keep hearing this is viewers are fickle. <coughs> They're totally fickle. They keep moving, you know, viewership where that fits. You know, they just move from one to the next to the next. And when we look at having so many fast channels, like we're up to 3,000 fast channels, which again is crazy. I yeah. think that's a few too many, you know. And the people do get frustrated with some fast channels because they don't understand STE ad inserts and things like that. It's like, that time is up, it's time for an ad. <coughs> yep. Very frustrating. And um, interestingly, uh, one, of, one of the disappointments, I think, of one of the trends that you showed in terms of investment, of, of interested investment by companies was that on sustainability. Um, do you want to just unpack about what that number was again, just to remind me? Well, well yeah, let, so let's look at the sustainability <coughs> uh, rates or numbers and, and really how that fell down the chart. It actually went more negative at this point in the, in the year. And, and I think the reason for that is it's very clear unless they're getting money back on sustainability they're not even going to look at it. Now, of course, within the EU, we're seeing regulations. And in talking to people, I did a lot of this at IBC, people are now falling back saying, oh, I'm just going to follow the EU recommendation. And I don't think that's a good idea. That just means they're not in it. There's no skin in the game. So I make that's a big difference. The one thing I do like to highlight, though, is it is a little tiresome when people talk about carbon footprints. Carbon footprints don't mean anything unless you understand the exact environment you're in. So you shouldn't be focusing on carbon footprints, it's carbon reduction. Now what a peer does is really good because you've taken products and you've reduced the size of it. So now when people are doing remotes or they're putting in their OBs, shipping costs is a lot less because you've compacted it. And of course as soon as you compact it, then your power usage is way down. Absolutely, and it's interesting to see, obviously, there are some markets that are mandating those 
sustainability power reduction credentials um, and other markets where especially I would have to say in the US where actually it's the attractiveness of the lower power cost and the sheer reduction in space that's really actually driving the take up of, of, of the something like our kit that's got that density benefit. Now where do we see AI going with with reduction on that? How, how will that help? What do you think? Wow. Okay, he's he's turned into question master now. Have you noticed that? Suddenly he's he's taken the mantle. He's taken well, the mantle. You're holding the mic, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I think AI is an interesting one. I still have a terminology issue between AI and ML. That's fair game. Yeah, be fair because game. I think... Almost, I, I don't think we're ever going to teach people the difference, so I've moved on. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a buzzword, isn't it? But I think from a machine learning perspective, I think there is a fantastic opportunity within the live production workflow. So some real stuff, not only just on effectively measurability and analytics, which obviously we've been doing to some degree with some, some pretty significant compute analysis already. But I think as we look at automating more and more of the live production elements that we're doing, um, you know, whether that's metadata extraction, whether it's auto cutting, um, automatic PTZ work, virtual PTZ work, all of that stuff, you know, what we were talking about in the panel this morning was one of the things was the fact that you know, broadcasters don't necessarily have more money to spend on tech, but they want to do more with the money they have got. And I think um, the fact that with the, the movement to AI tools, as well as the, you know, the compute centric production workflows that we're starting to embrace now, um, that makes some events viable that weren't viable before. And it also means that the the, the amount of personnel you need to actually resource an event to create a relatively high value production is vastly reduced. Now I will talk about AI with regards to our our BAM awards, our IBM BAM awards that, that we do at the NAB uh, Las Vegas time frame as well as IBC. A lot of entries had AI, but okay. there wasn't specific ones that were AI only. They used AI for improvement on workflow. Sure, they absolutely. used AI for understanding churn rates, yeah. you know, being proactive with the churn rate before they've lost the sub. So I was really pleased to see that. So we talk about this bubble. Is AI just a 3D bubble? No, it's, it's, it, I, I think we're, we're hitting it kind of like the internet. It was a big bubble, it's exciting, but it turns into something useful. Absolutely, absolutely. So give me another couple of trend highlights of observations that are relevant to the, to the live production elements of the industry that you've seen. Well, when we're looking at live production, and I'm going to get into this, and that is Providence and what we're doing with regards to making sure that the content is real. Yep. And what we're seeing with C2PA, you're taking your digital signature right in your camera, you know it's real, it's being logged in, whether it's a blockchain or whatever, it doesn't really matter, it's being logged in, and every process is being logged in with every change. It doesn't mean AI can't change it. It just means a person had to say, AI can change it. Yeah. And I think what's really cool about that is that's going to make sure that as things get modified, you know whether or not they're real or not and where that fits in. And I think as we get more into live production, we're going to see that more and more happening. Absolutely. Jumping back to that very, very first comment you made about hybrid um, being, being, being a thing, I think there, is, there are two levels of hybrid that I see within the live production workflow. One is that we need a mixture of appliances like at the acquisition site to actually get, get all of our signals into the infrastructure, um, as well as potentially a more compute-centric production workflow downstream, be that hosted on private compute or on, on public compute. And then there's the hybrid of the the, the difference between the, the privately hosted infrastructure for, for software and the use of public cloud. And do you have any observations of what you've seen on, on any of those splits and well, the trends there? Absolutely. There, there is still questions where people are worried about putting all my eggs in one basket into a cloud service. Can I handle that? Will it deal with it? What happens if I have conductivity problem? Where that fits. So hybrid fits well in that. 
and uh, people still want to have that tactile feel and that is you know they they want to have that surface and i think that that really makes the difference so does that bring that on prem well maybe to a certain point but that brings us actually into the control plane discussion absolutely and here we go Uh, here we go talk to me about your thoughts here so one of the big things as you know from our both work in the past was getting more interop going making sure people can focus making sure vendors products can work together and then all of a sudden we started throwing in cloud services and microservices and then people think well why do i need that in a control plane well you actually you need it more in the control plane it doesn't matter whether or not you're you're switching something Uh, in a cloud service or you're switching it local you still have to have that control protocol to set that up and where does that fit and people with live they need that latency is still the issue that i do worry about and you can say well we're faster whatever but everybody's shooting everything on 4k or 8k now anyway so you've got to be able to handle that latency and audio Wow, do people forget about audio. Drives me crazy. How about you? I've actually done two presentations yesterday in the media over IP theatre, both on audio in live production, different aspects of it. One was on moving to compute and one was on just how we actually backhaul and and manipulate audio for remote productions. And, um, yeah, I think think the latency thing is very, very easy to forget and audio obviously is a far more critical has far more critical latency requirements than video does in many places especially with that return loop so i think there are you know there are some things in terms of the audio processing that we're never going to be able to remote from the location itself there are you know there is there are some loops that you have to keep local to keep people sane in what they hear absolutely so uh, so audio is certainly a catch on that but let's jump on to security for a minute I never do something where I don't talk about security. <laughs> He's back to interviewing mode. Right interviewing you. Well, somebody has to do that. So security, as you know, in our technology and trends roadmap uh, that you helped me on, uh, we focus on secure architectures now. And people are focused on secure content because they're worried someone's going to steal the content. But they really got to focus on secure architecture because people will hack in, they will steal things, there's no question about that. And I think more and more, the, the, the penny's kind of dropping, but you know, I'm not really seeing enough of it that, that people feel it strong enough. How about you? Yeah, I, I think the biggest frustration of security from where I sit is, A, I think when we started to do the migration to IP and IT as media organizations, as a media industry, we didn't elevate that priority high enough. I think that's probably a retrospective, we could say. And I think the other, the other thing is, we really haven't learned best practice in its entirety from the IT industry, because the bigger IT industry actually knows how to, how to do security. You know, you, you, you know the, the, the big people that are doing IT have learned those lessons. And I think really what we're, all, we're almost playing catch up within the media industry in adopting what are the standard best practices of IT. Right, and when you when you look at that, you know, the, the big cloud providers say we have better security than you ever will, which is probably true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe for the content, but not necessarily for the conductivity, because that's not their job. Yeah, and I think I think there are two issues on on the security. One is the actual media flow connectivity over whatever it's traversing, and the other one, which I think is even more critical, and this certainly, from the discussions I've had earlier this week at some of the other events I've been at, it's the security of the control plane, especially when we're actually moving outside of facility. So as we're moving as we're moving this industry more and more to distributed production, you know where the control surface is maybe different location from the processing maybe a different location from the acquisition site and when those are when you need to actually have control signals moving between those you know we've got some great tools that have been developed in the control plane open tools in recent years Um, but actually using them in a secure way especially when you're going through across security domains through dmz's etc is a challenge and i think we need to do some more work to educate people and to make sure that the standards that we have evolved are fully 
usable in all of those different applications. So let's talk about other markets for a minute. I'm turning this around. But Here we go again. <laughs> let's do that. I'll have a little of my tea first before I get into it. Me too. Thank you. I was chatting with, with a storyteller today, and we, she was telling me about some of the things she did. And she says, well, it's not really broadcast, but we're using broadcast equipment. Well, I guess we are, I guess we are. And I said, well, the point is broadcast is one to many. Aren't you producing something that goes out to many people? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be on a transmitter. So really, it, it is similar. So media is just a form of broadcasting at this point. And I think we have to get rid of that mentality and, and actually, when you look at a lot of the productions that are going out uh, that are not scripted, they're high quality yep. is what we're looking at. Yeah. And I think also there's a large amount of corporates that are doing a lot of almost tier one broadcast type production work just for internal use as well now. Oh, training is, is like way off the chart when it comes to great. Speaking of training, what are we going to do about our industry with this? You know, one of the things that... I put together and John I've actually started with IBM was basic you know 101 training and they're just basic videos on workflow and here's how it works and here's how basic production there's even a video in there from how Coronation Street was put together I've upgraded it with LED lights and things like that but people that come into the business they need to understand that it doesn't matter where they work in in the organization within our community they need to get those Wonderful. Hey, Stan, thank you so much for sparing a little bit of time in your hectic schedule here at NAB New York. It's been great to see you uh, a few times. I bumped into him a few times on the show floor and then we had the great session this morning as well. So thank you for your time. I look forward to chatting again, probably at the next event, wherever and whenever that may be. Oh, probably in another couple of weeks and, and hopefully we'll have something with real tea. Yeah. So uh, it's time for tea is over. There's been something brewing here and we hope you uh, have a good time and it's over and out from NNB New York. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Andy.